Hey everyone, it's Ben from Songwriters on Process, and today I am very excited to bring you my conversation with Mark Morton from Lamb of God and Alan Johannes. Uh, we spoke a couple of months ago. Mark was at home in Virginia, and Al was uh, quarantined in Chile. He was there for uh, Lollapalooza, but it got canceled. And I say it's a conversation, not really an interview, because I kind of stayed out of the way the whole time. Uh, let those two talk, have at it for about an hour. I first interviewed Al back in 2010, and we have stayed in touch since then. Uh, and interviewed, interviewed Mark in 2014, and we have stayed in touch since then as well. Mark Morton is obviously a guitarist and songwriter for the hugely influential and huge metal slash hard rock band Lamb of God out of Richmond, Virginia. Mark also has two solo albums out, uh, Anesthetic and Ether, that showcase the side of his talents that he you don't really see in Lamb of God. It's much, Ether specifically, is much more acoustic based, but they both kind of showcase a different part of his music talent. He's got tremendous range as a guitarist, um, and both of them are fantastic. Uh, and Al has been around for many years, um, he started out uh, as an abandoned high school with three future members of the Red Hot Chili Peppers, but after that he founded, co-founded the band Eleven. Uh, he has worked with Chris Cornell. He was in the touring group for Them Crooked Vultures. He was in Queens of the Stone Age. He has produced Mark Lanigan's, uh, several of Mark Lanigan's solo albums. In fact, both Mark and Al worked on Mark Lanigan's last or newest solo album, uh, Mark uh, wrote and played on the album and Al produced it. So they actually collaborated together and that's the first time I think they met. Um, both of them have new albums out. Um, Lamb of God has a new album out. This came out a couple of months ago and it is great. And Al has a new solo album out as well called Hum and it's also fantastic. So check out both of those as well as check out their social media pages. They are both very uh, prolific on social media. Mark has a great Twitter feed where he is constantly interacting uh, with uh, people who tweet at him. And Al has, I think, in my opinion, one of the best uh, music accounts on Instagram. Mark, I think, talks about this in the interview as well. But uh, it is Al, most nights, just jams. And he's got these late night jam sessions and he's got endless guitars. I've been fortunate to be in his house and to be in those rooms with those guitars and to hear him jam. And I can't even tell you how many he has, the different styles. And so a lot of times he just picks up these guitar guitars and starts to play. So that's it. The interview is about an hour long. I actually cut it down. Again, it's a conversation, but it's these two guys talking about the process. Um, and I hope you enjoy it, and thanks for watching. You, do you find that all of the spare time, because I've done a bunch of these interviews this week, is mm -hmm. making you more creative or less creative? I feel like when, when, when we don't have deadlines, um, you know, some people work re really well under deadlines, but when we don't have deadlines, you have this expanse of, of time, you know, maybe there's a, when the urgency isn't there to create, maybe it doesn't happen. So I'm curious if, if this affects your creative process at all. Uh, I think for me, there have been moments when it has, um, I think for me, if I'm, I don't write well on the road, I'll write lyrics on the road. Cause I'll have a notebook and it's easy to sit in your bunk or sit wherever you are and, you know, just kind of scribble down stuff that's bounced around in your head. Um, but music, I don't write well on the road. I'm, I'm on a bus with, you know, four or five other guys. And it's just, you know, this just, it's it, in the dressing room, it's loud and there's people in and out and I can't really focus like that. So it's interesting when I'm on tour, I really only play guitar for about an hour and a half a day. Um, whereas really? home, I have access to it all the time. I mean, I could play, but it's just, again, you can't really focus. Um, and writing for me is kind of, uh, I don't know, I need a certain environment, I think, to be able to tap into it. Um, so at home, not being on the road as we haven't been, we've canceled a number of tours or postponed or you know, whatever the, the semantics are right now. <laughs> um, you know, I, uh, it kind of comes when it comes with me. Um, it, it's not being on the road. Like I'll just, I, I, I was describing it to someone not long ago where I can feel a song coming on. I can feel, it almost feels like my mind needs to vomit or something like I can feel like, you know, my girlfriend will hear me say all the time, I need a day of music because I got like, something's got to come out, you know what I mean? And that just kind of comes when it comes, I can't plan for it. I'm not like the type, that, I mean, I guess I could say like, well, I'm going to go get a house in the Outer Banks for two weeks and I'm going to write. 
and that's cool. And I'll probably come out of that with stuff, but sometimes it's just sort of, it's more like an, kind of an antenna for whatever's floating around and it just kind of comes when it comes. So I have a little studio over here. I have a, we rehearse out in the garage, but I have a little room here in the house that has just my little computer set up and some speakers and, and the little stuff I need just to document ideas. And if I feel it, I just kind of jump in there. I have, um, I think just by virtue of the fact of I have not been touring, I've been listening to a lot of music while I'm going out to get my little exercise and stuff like that. And that tends to be a catalyst for me of just listening to stuff. It sort of starts just kind of pouring ideas in the head and some weird morph, you know, amalgamation of those things I've been listening to kind of finds its way out. And so that's been happening. I've written you know, to probably like three instrumentally, like three you know, like songs, like three to four minute pieces of music that I feel like are pretty, you know, you know, concise and, and a, a solid demo. Um, so, and, and there's more coming. I'm in that phase right now where I feel like um, I need to creatively vomit because I definitely have like some stuff I want to get out. Oddly enough, right now it's metal, um, which is odd because we just finished the Lamb of God album. So I usually feel like that rag has been squeezed out for a while, but now I just kind of have this metal thing going on so i'm got a metal tune in me i think and i've written some more kind of rock tunes recently um and as you know ben you know and al you know too you know i do stuff that's not metal and and usually that's uh um at the risk of sounding like a jerk about the lamb stuff like sometimes like more for recreation um more i guess i don't want to say genuine because it's all genuine um but i i, I think uh, there's this I've been doing metal writing and releasing metal records for so long that now that recently I've had the opportunity to write stuff that's more rock or even some acoustic kind of bass stuff. It's a little, it's, it feels a little uh, newer for me to at least have the opportunity to put that stuff out. So it has a different kind of shine on it for me right now. Yeah. The, the song, the song that, the, that you wrote with Mark and, and uh, the, I had the pleasure of recording is really incredible. It's one of my favorite things I've done in a long time that it's so, uh so raw and beautiful and and so heartfelt you know that was pretty special so that that's really cool that you know you have that uh, uh entire side of things you know I'm like for me I'm finishing my solo record just now i'm kind of feeling instrumental music you know like little soundtracky weird shit and i've got enough stuff with me that i just want to get started i have to happen to borrow my cousin's violin i've got a flute over here and i've got my little mellotron patches and stuff and i'm kind of hearing that for some reason you know um anyway yeah sorry well no i wanted to ask you al too because i mean we, when we were working that that process of of working on that those couple pieces of music we did with lanigan was such a mm -hmm. wonderful experience for me like to um just to be like i i know i said this when i was there but i i'll tell ben this like it really does encapsulate for me like you know when you're like ninth or tenth grade and the cool kids save a speech for you at the lunch table like hey man come sit with us or like we're going to the party do you want to hop in we'll give you a ride like and you're like oh these are the cool guys like that's how i felt that day you know oh, I mean? that's really I'm, sweet i'm so like i'm such a fan of both of y'all's work and just it's just to be able to be in process with you guys like that was just like really a special moment for me um and you know having i got to play with mark before that we did uh you know, we did a song on the anesthetic record and then we did a little performance of that together too. So just really cool. And then to get in a room with you and see your process, like I learned, um, even just from that day, you know, recording, I learned uh, a little bit about your vibe and recording and how um, I remember, you know, I'm in this world of like very technical kind of like concisely edited metal. And I mm -hmm. realized that that's kind of specific to that genre. And so working mm -hmm. on my solo stuff, we loosen those reins a little bit because it's rock yeah. and roll. And I appreciate that. But you're like sort of the energy you had about just getting like a cool, like human take of a pass of the song. Like mm -hmm. um, if I remember correctly, the, 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 the main Lanigan song, the picking apples from a tree song that we yeah. did was pretty much one pass, it was and, one I'm, pass yeah. and I'm almost like kind of holding my breath through it because I, you know, I think we did five, six, seven takes maybe. And, but by that one, I knew I was like, okay, I think this is going to make it, you know what yeah. I mean? And we got through it and there was a couple little glitches. And I was like, I, I asked, I asked Al, I was like, do you want to fix those? And he's like, no, I won't fix no. those. Like you played that man. And I was like, yeah, that's well, cool. That's right. Like, it's like, there's a pulse to it and we don't need to go in there and polish every little, 
every little scratch or every, you know, every little sound of the fret noise or your finger scraping, like, don't fix that shit. Like, like, oh, I'm sorry. Am I allowed to cuss on this? I don't know. You are, yes. <laughs> um, Fuck yeah, we're allowed to cuss. Yeah, yeah, right. So <laughs> don't, don't fix that stuff. Like, let it be real. Let it be human. And it was wonderful to be reminded of that, like, the, the pulse, the heartbeat, the humanness of what we do, because a lot of my exposure to studio settings is there's a process of removing that just because of the nature of the genre that yeah, I work, no, no, they make, they work most sense. prominently in, you know? Yeah, it, it totally makes sense in this. But I mean, here we have the opportunity, <clears throat> you know, whenever you, one can, it's really great. Like if, if there's a tape machine and the band is down to, to go for it, um, you know, knowing it's going to be almost impossible to do some heavy editing. Obviously, you can splice bits of different takes together. But, um, I mean, I, I find that uh, uh, just it's always attracted me. I mean, obviously, if we listen to a lot of the stuff, uh, it's whatever it takes to make the music great. There's no, nothing wrong with, you know, editing or, or fixing. And, but, but something like this where it's, you know, he's, he's breathing with you and, and you're playing the song. And literally, the, the, the takes were just there to get to the point where, you know, you can sense that you, you're lost in it and that's that. So, therefore, the tiny little, you know, fret noise or, or one muted note that could have been ringing or whatever, that, that has nothing to do with how it's going to affect the, a listener emotionally. And you play into that. I mean, God, if we listen to some of our childhood, you know, hero records and how loose those were, how many funny things are happening there. I mean, it came later, I guess, when, when we could technologically go in and do stuff, then it became a thing. But before that, it was no like, now, you know, they've got these weird things where you can tune uh, part of a file, you know, like a note that's inside the thing. I'm like, that's freaking me out. Like, oh, that guitar is out of tune. Well, put the thing on it. It just takes the one note inside the thing. What? You know, anyway, it's a, uh, I try to stay away from that because, uh, uh, I don't really think that in the end of, uh, uh, especially the kind of stuff like what we're doing, you know, doesn't, it's, it's it, eventually you end up overthinking it and then getting further and further away from the magic of that human moment. So, yeah. I wanted to ask you, Al, um, you know, in just listening to a lot of the music you worked on, the music you've written and recorded and the stuff you've done with other people, particularly, you know, because I'm, you know, such a big fan of Mark Lanigan's work. Mm -hmm. um, and just in your body of work, and I, how do you sort of make the decision on your kind of the amount, degree, the approach to the instrumentation, and also the, the sort of the, your, your, your production uh, approach because mm -hmm. I don't feel like you're one of these guys in terms of production where you kind of can be boxed into a certain lane because a lot of mm -hmm. the stuff um, with Mark is is really kind of stripped down really bare in terms of the instrumentation and just you know almost almost barren dare I say and then a yeah. lot of your stuff is so multi-layered and just mm -hmm. it, at least sonically it sounds to me and I, and I mm -hmm. think I can hear like a ton of stuff going on and just yeah. stacked on top of each other and and I'm just wondering, you know, is that something that you consider when you're going into a project? Is it something you take song by song? Is it like a, a phase you go through where right now I'm on this, like, I'm on this more barren type shit and that's where I'm at right now. And then now I'm getting into my, my Pink Floyd moment or whatever, or is right. it just kind of something you do intuitively just based on the moment? Like, I think, I think the second, what you just said, intuitively in the moment, it all depends. Um, I, I try to, you know, come into it really, you know, uh, without any preconceptions and, and, and maybe I have a, a knowledge of the artist and with, in, in Mark's case, we worked together for so many years and it, it all, it's always different. The main thing I know is that he doesn't really like to be in this, uh, do, now it's still different because he's got a studio at home, but in general, he didn't like being in the studio for very long. So I had to nail down what the song was all <laughs> going to do pretty quick so that he, he could like sing it and then and go away till the next day you know it's like okay I'm gonna come. bye um so with him i became really uh, uh uh sensitive to like reading him you know he wouldn't say i need the, you know this kind of thing when this kind of you know just kind of describe it to me and nail down first what the song is meaning like have him played on acoustic you know down 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 and then and then the this, the, the arrangement of it, um, and then immediately try to track down something with, a, with you know, either with a click or just freeform, and then add 
a few textures to it over a period of an hour or two, and then he would sing it, and then we would invite people to come and, and add their magic, or we would have to send it over to another part of the world for strings or whatever. Um, I think I think like with Jimmy World uh, that, that I worked on a record, I got them to record on tape uh, all together at the same time. That was, you know, different. I mean, with my stuff, with Eleven, it was different too. Everything has its own kind of... Uh, in the moment thing, it's, it's hard to make the plan. You kind of, uh, you kind of uh, uh, listen for what the song is uh, want, wanting and what the chemistry in the room is in terms of what people you know, want to do. It's like, if, if you know, work with somebody and they want to go absolutely mental in layers and layers and layers, then that's what it's going to be. I, don't, I try to be really transparent uh, in terms of what my own thing, like my own stuff is like, you know, that, that just kind of do it the way that I feel is right. And each record, my new one, for example, was written and recorded in the moment because I needed to um, express something. And, and kind of been coming out of, of a pretty scary illness, I, I, it was kind of an affirming for myself, trying to deal with all the the, the stuff that had caused me to be in, in mental and physical uh, distress and a lot of the sadness, you know, that built up after Chris passed away. It built up on top of you know, Natasha and my parents and my, my uncle that were kind of like my men mentors in life. And uh, I literally, that, that plan, uh, you know, the, it, 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 there was no plan. There was nothing written except I knew that I had to start and I wanted it to be in sequence. So literally each day I wrote and recorded song one and then song two. And then I would listen to the first two um, and then listen for that silence at the end of the two and what comes next. And then just imagine it like an album like that, you know? I mean, Dude, I, know I do of... that too in a song, man. I'll, I'll get to a part where it's like, okay, I've got the verses in the chorus and then I'll get uh -huh. to the bridge and it, well, there's no bridge yet. And I'll like listen to that silence. I love that you put it that way because it's yeah. like, what am I hearing? Okay, what am I hearing? Where does this thing want to go? Because at exactly. a certain point in your process, in my process of songwriting, like I almost now have a responsibility to the song to help it become what it already is. It's not exactly like, right. I don't, it's, it's almost like people always use the child metaphor like bef before I had children, I thought having a child was like, you get a dog and it's, that's your dog and you have a child and that's your child. It's not like, you're just mm -hmm. the one sort of in charge of helping it become what it's going to be. Yeah, exactly. Do you know what I mean? And you have yeah. an influence, but you, it's not your, you're not possessing it. And I feel the same way about songs in a way is at a certain you're point when it's no longer just an idea, like, you know, that moment where like it gets serious. You're like, okay, shit, I, I guess I'm not doing anything today because I got to work on this song, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. And you become now like responsible to it. So you yeah. listen to that silence and you hear what it wants to do and you help, uh, you help that manifest. And that's just like, so that to me is like one of the most magical moments about what we get to do. You're, you know you're what I so mean? Absolutely right. It's, it, it's, you, you, you hit the nail on the head a, a, a few times in terms of what I, I you know, envision like Tasha and I used to say, it's like our child, you know, and we're, we're, uh, kind of responsible for it. And also we used to look at it as a transmission that we uh, had trained our entire lives for to be able to receive and, and, and a message that, that, that because of everything that we'd lived to, we could uh, encapsulate or grab as much of that message. It also gives you a sense of, uh, of, of, of you know, this connection from ego, it's like, it's not my song, or I am this and this or that. And this is funny, because then we could listen to our own music, like, we almost like, we're thinking to, to, you know, ourselves and telling each other, like, you know, we really love so much music, and we're missing this vibe. And it doesn't exist. There's no song that does this. It has a bit of Stevie, has a bit of Zeppelin, has a bit of this, and then you know, and it does that. Okay, so let's fucking write, <laughs> let's write it and record it, and there it is. Uh, and on this process of this record, as I was la laying in bed listening to the, say, uh, two songs, and then I would have to, the third song the next day, going all the way to the 10 songs, I, I started picturing almost like it already exists in the future. And then since information scientifically, possibly, according to a lot of the quantum physics experiments, can travel in, in any direction, then it's already existing somewhere. So all I gotta do is, is listen really closely and just go and then just grab it. You know, it's already there. What, what is it that I did? What is it that I played? How did I sing it? What lyrics did I write? Uh, it's already existing somewhere. Um, I know that might be just a mental trick, but it really, really helps to take 
kind of the thinking out, out of it more puts it more into the instinctive realm and the mythical realm where you're like you know because it's really awesome to be sitting there in the process and feeling like this is magic that you're doing like it's a, some kind of a chemical thing and 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 obviously it, it does have that power because look how it can move people i mean like when i when i went on the solo tour there were people coming up to me after the shows thanking me for how much the music from spark helped them heal from their loss and all this and and like it was so it's such a honor and i'm so humbled by it you know and so it has music has this power as you know you know, like you, you know your fans and and people that listen to all the stuff that we've done it's it has all this power so it is like a weird magical process you know um i mean all creative endeavors being poetry uh literature painting you know it can it can transport and and, and move people and 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 uh change them for the for the better and, and such a a uh, profound way that uh you know it's pretty serious stuff you know i think i think uh um i for me i mean i mean i've seen people uh, uh operate in a very intellectual way and in planning it and stuff and and that works if it works for you but I, i'm i'm I, I try i try not to <laughs> let that happen because i will you know in the past i've over overthought it uh out of existence or it's lost a bit of the magic for me you know i, I when you, you know, like when you were working uh, on something for a long time and then somebody, somebody says, let's listen to the demo. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, the thing that we just recorded in the rehearsal room and then you put it on and you're like, oh shit, well, that's so much better. Like, it doesn't sound good. It's like the parts are not quite worked out, but there's something there that we're not getting right now, which is that process, right? It is like, I, I have a, you remind me of a friend of mine that tells me that, that, that says often, like there's a difference there's a big difference between knowing something intellectually mm -hmm. and then knowing something spiritually. And, mm -hmm. and, and you can know things both ways, but one is just like a lot heavier. And yeah. like, this all sounds like really heady kind of like new age kind of stuff, but it's all really true because yeah. if you, you know, in, in terms of the process we're talking about that we are really just a part of the process and, Mm -hmm. of like this music that we're a part of creating and that we work together to create or work with other people to create kind of channels through our effort there in that part of the process and then goes out into the world and touches people's lives like in a mm -hmm. really really powerful emotional real way like it yeah. impacts people's lives the way like you talk about you know people um getting so much healing out of spark and and mm -hmm. and, and all the emotion that you put into that that's very relevant to your experience and heavy in and of itself. But then the fact that it expands out into the world and touches people and becomes part of their experience. Like yeah. the fact that we get to be a part of that process is humbling. It is an honor and it is something I'm grateful for because it's so powerful and without any part of that process, none of it happens. So it's about it all coming together, which gives it its, its weight. It's, it's, it's value really. Like we yeah. just made, our songs and they never came out and touched people well then they would just be our songs and they might be therapeutic for us but that's you know it's yeah. just so much bigger than that and it becomes part of someone else's life and that in its sense is what keeps it kind of carrying projecting out into the experience you know what i mean it, it all sounds so lofty but it's not it's really no, it's powerful not, it's, it's really not. true man i mean somebody branded it as new age uh, at one point um and then there was negative negative connotations here and there people keep making jokes or in movies or whatever but it's an internal thing it's like you know music used to be used uh, uh in, in the ritualistic life and in, in mythological life um you know for e eons where we're like we're like you know sitting at, around the, the 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 fire and beating the drums and singing and hollering and connecting and, and all those rituals and and you see that when, when in, in concerts, when like you know the, either the mosh pit or, or like people lose their their their, their sense of physicality and, and become this energetic uh, circular uh, part of a circular energy that happens with music um, and, and and the way that it moves people. And I think is that the, that uh, the power that music has to 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 communicate that and and to connect us goes all, all the way back to its original uh, function, which is like a, a, an expression of humanity and divinity at the same time. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a trip, but, it, but it, it has that. It's, it's so much you know, more visceral than, than uh, a lot of other things that, that, that people get up and do. You know? 
has um, but, yeah Oh, go ahead, Ben. Sorry. Yeah, I was going to say, well, kind of, well Ben, there you are. I'm sorry. Yeah, was, well, ben. <laughs> I see for all those, uh, I'm staying the hell out of the way. When you <laughs> but I think what I, my follow-up to that is how do you, both of you mentioned kind of the weight that music has. How do you, how do you ensure that that weight doesn't impede the process itself? I mean, that, that's, you both talk about the impact your music can have, but, mm -hmm. you know, how do you, how do you set that aside and kind of not think about that during that process? I think that um, I think that in itself is a process. I hate to make it a riddle, but yeah. you know, the more you work, um, and there's different levels of working. There's just the pure creative, and then there's the the actual like releasing music and, and your fan base, and it's it's all kind of a growth. And I think the more experience you have doing that, hopefully, it's been my experience anyway that I have sort of grown into a place where I start to um, recognize that it's important for me to be genuine and to be honest as an artist. Um, and that can be real simple. It can just be as like, as simple as not like in the context of Lamb of God, like not trying to chase some trend or some, mm -hmm. you know, a couple of big new bands that have this certain sound or whatever. And first morphing ourselves to sound like that because we want to stay relevant or fresh or something like that. I feel like that's a, that's a trap and it's one we haven't uh, one we haven't fallen into i think for me personally um in terms of the solo side it was such a, a such a i had been entrenched in lamb for so long that by the time i had the opportunity to start releasing songs i had been writing that stuff anyway just as a pure outlet um you know i, I it was coming out of me anyway it was just going in a different pile because that kind of stuff wasn't ever going to really work in lamb so it came from a place of purity it came from a place of, of a, a, it was a genuine thing i wasn't the songs were there before i ever realized i was going to ever have a solo release right so that in itself kind of kept the um uh, kept the waters pretty pure there and so i i feel like i cling to that like as long as i'm honest with um, with what I'm doing creatively and learning to tr kind of trust my artistry um, and learning to, I guess, like, like know when it's not good enough and when it is, know when something's done and when it's not, um, you know, make sure it's coming from a place of like, do I dig this? Because if I dig it, then it's, then at least it's genuine. It may not be good, but at least I, if I dig it, then it's genuine. Um, and it's representative of where I am creatively. Process. And I interviewed uh, Anthony Doerr, and he won the Pulitzer Prize for uh, his book, All the Light We Cannot See. It was a novel that came out a couple of years ago. And I asked him about writer's block, and he said, writer, he doesn't believe in writer's block. A lot of writers don't. And he called it a failure of courage. Mm -hmm. um, he doesn't believe that writer's block exists, calls it a fa failure of courage. And I think he and others have said, just don't, you know, don't overthink it. N nothing you have to say is that important. People aren't hanging on your words. So yeah. writer's block, you know, doesn't really exist. And I, mm -hmm. that idea of failure of courage, um, I think really stuck with me that yeah. those things don't exist. I'm, what do you think I mean, about that's that? An interesting way of, 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 of putting it. I mean, I think to kind of, kind of connect to the two things is, is and something, something Mark said is like making yourself happy, uh, meaning like uh, in the sense that we, as creators, we we also love the thing, uh, the 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 medium that we're creating in. So I love music. So if I like, if I I'm, I'm a fan and like what I'm doing at the moment, like recording the song and or the way that it's going, that's a big part of how it's being guided. It also takes away that component, getting to the you know writer's block thing, the failure of courage. Is that is it is that failure of courage uh, that that constant? Is it because uh, the person um, doesn't isn't happy with what they're writing at the moment, or are they so focused on thinking that is this good? Is this going to give me a Pulitzer Prize? Are people mm -hmm. going to like this? Is this as good as my last one? Am I ever going to write a good one again? You know, and and it, that's a fucking mental chatter that is so mm -hmm. easy for us to 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 you know because our bio survival circuit depends on this mind that we have, so we can navigate this place but then if, if, if we give it too much power it'll just destroy us you know because it'll make us every bad decision is overthought you know just instinctive like feel it is this do i like this okay is this you know, is, um, okay oh this guitar no that's the wrong sound put that away okay this one 
oh yeah, that's it. Okay, cool. Let's do this. Okay. And then I'm, you know, if I actually had to stop and go, is this any good? You know? And, and so I, I try to like, like, yes, of course you, you, you know, you're guiding it as, as you're doing it, but you're also trying to enjoy it and then trying to just be in the moment. And one thing that really helped me early on, cause you know, I, unfortunately, I, uh, and fortunately I, was prone to panic attacks since I was very young. And so meditation, you know, mm. like a mantra where you just repeat this one word in your mind and then all the thoughts try to bother you and you just focus on the word, you know, you're focusing on the word and the thought bubbles come and you push them away, push them away and eventually they lose their power. So uh, I think that is, you know, any kind of mental technique that we could do where we stop the thinking and the judgment because i think you know because i felt a version of writer's block before where where like i i was i wasn't enjoying sitting down and tri- because i was judging it the whole time and then and i and i don't judge it from an internal point of view because if i'm judging it internally then i do something about it i'm like i don't like this court i don't like this court oh, this is too much this is like then i just make a decision right there i like this okay i'm gonna do that it's that other internal thing it's like you know what are they going to say? What do they think? Is this too much like the other thing, et cetera? You know? Yeah. It's trippy. Okay. Alan, how much has or, or has the film sort of changed your angle or perspective on your body of work, your process, what you want to do next? Has it had any impact at all on, um, you know, where you sit in, in your process and where you sit in your goals and your ambitions creatively? By the film, you mean the 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 movie? The documentary, yeah. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that was really trippy because I I didn't plan and that that kind of happened. And then the guy showed up in 2010 when I uh, came back to uh, Chile to meet my father, and I'd been missing for 46 years, I think, and grow you know grew up in the states. But they started filming, and then shit started happening, and then it's weird. It's like I'm sitting there, in 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 a sense, it had this like this weird. Uh, externalizing of things that were happening, you know, um, and then like Chris passed away and then the premiere was just a little bit afterwards and I had to go up and perform and then it was all too surreal. Um, I think that, that I, I, I tried to forget about it a little bit and, and uh, not try to imagine like from then on, it's like, you know, part two or you know, or the part of it where I'm imagining would be really, you know, what the producer probably would really benefit from if I died right now. Like, they really make this film like a total hit. Um, but because of, because of the circumstances, I ended up uh, 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 just literally trying to. I mean, my wish now that I that I after this last illness is and, and this record that I just made is to be as creative as often as possible as I can and do as much as I can like. A real urgency to like go out and play shows and like collaborate more and like and and you know just do it because like I can't you know every day on on Instagram almost every day I post jams and all this stuff that kind of if I could do that all the time like you know you know uh, call Ben Shepard hey Ben you know, can I come over I, then let's say bring a little rig let's make a couple of tunes or you know <laughs> and, and get to, get together with all all my peeps and do it all the time. Um, of course, that energy is like, let's do this in pandemic, you know. Those jams, uh, those jams on your Instagram are insane. They're, you know, for anyone that ends up watching this that isn't familiar, it's like pretty much a daily dose of like just the most amazing like guitar and stringed instrument work that just sounds like so exotic and so beyond <laughs> like. Thank you, bro anything anyone would play and you're just like this dude just like <laughs> pick this thing up and hit record and like i'm just i quit uh, <laughs> but it's beautiful it's awesome thank you dude so i'm just you know it, I, I look forward to them all the time thank you it's like that adage is like is the devil uh wise because he's the devil or because he's old um, <laughs> i've been around you know i started playing i mean, 54 years ago 58 now four years old grab the guitar listen to music I just listened to so much music and played for so long that now, I'm, I'm, you know, it's, it's, it's not, I mean, there's millions and millions of more technical uh, uh, musicians and guitar players. I have, I, I do what I do and I have enough technique to do what I need to do. And I just, I'm just love being able to communicate with that and kind of blurring the lines between 
between uh, musical uh, cultures and styles and stuff, you know, because they're also connected. They all come from a source of, uh, originally. So uh, Palachian and Celtic and Indian classical and uh, Persian and, you know, uh, flamenco and South American. And then they all kind of start to blend into like, they take little, little uh, left turns, right turns or, or going circles or whatever, but they all kind of lead to the same thing. So I love to try to connect that in, and I mean, to, 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 to let that kind of mishmash inside me and then present it uh, uh, as my expression. And that, I mean, I'm not focused. I mean, I'm just analyzing now. So I'm like, I'm going to do this. And, but, <laughs> no, but it does. And it sounds like you. And I think that's as a, just purely as a player, um, I gave up a long, fortunately, I surrendered a long time ago at trying to um, be the fastest or the, or the most technical or, or this guy or that guy. And I, I think I started wrapping my head around the idea that um, I'm a pretty decent player. And that's good enough for me to sort of establish my voice on the instrument. Exactly. And exactly. if I can, and rather than, I don't want to be the fastest or the most theoretical or the, or the whatever, the whatever, I would just really aspire to be, to find a place where if someone hears me play, they can say, oh, that sounds like yeah. Mark, you know, and you definitely have that where when you hear it, it's just like, and that's Alan Johannes right there, man. It's just that that sound, that sort of mix of all that, like sort of kind of exotic, but kind of rock, and just that that just it's really really unique and cool. And uh, no one in the world does it better than you. And believe it or not, gardening has come up a lot with songwriters. <laughs> as the way that song that that ideas songs come to them, and and you know, I, I guess how how for I don't want both of you guys to answer this, but but I mm -hmm. guess how how important is boredom those kind of activities to the process i mean I it's funny because one of the things i was there was a couple questions that i wanted to ask al and one of them was along the lines of what you're asking which is how much of the music in your head makes it out because that is like that's the and for me with your question ben boredom like i, I honestly don't ever get bored and i think the reason i don't get bored um, is some form of lunacy and some kind of intertwined with this idea that there is constantly music. When it's music, it's great. When it's chatter and negative self-talk and, and, you know, all this, you know, psychodrama, that's a different thing. And I got ways I process that now too that are healthy. Um, but when it's music, it's, it's great. And, um, and yeah, it's monotony almost that allows that to, to sort of like, come front and center. So cutting the grass is a big one for me. I, you know, I live on property. I have a big, huge field in the front yard and I'll cut it and it takes me like two hours to cut it. And I'll listen to music and I'll flip around on my music, listening to different stuff. And then I'll just turn it off and kind of listen to what's in my head. And like, mm -hmm. oddly the hum and cycle and the lope of the engine and the, all that thing starts swirling around mm -hmm. and I hear music, man. I really yeah, do. Yeah. And, uh, I, you know, lyric ideas will come to me and it's 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 it really happens a lot cutting grass gardening too you know that's been a new thing i just put a bunch of bunch of vegetables and stuff in some beds up there and, and kind of doing that but in any kind of task where it's like i'm i'm occupied but mentally i'm lulled into this sense where i can tap into the sounds that are happening in my head um are really conducive to me kind of getting into that process. And, and so when I can walk away from those moments and actually remember something or kind of sort of like, you know, coalesce an idea that I can hang out, that I can reference somehow, either be a melody, either be a visual, visual, visualization of like a chord pattern or something or a beat or even just a vibe, just like a point of reference or an idea conceptually, when I can carry that with me into the studio or into the house and onto a guitar that's when you know i know something's starting it would seem like and then al i want to hear you answer this question but it seems like lyrics though and i, I could be way off base in this but but it seems like that would be harder i could see that happening with music because the monotony of mm. you know listen but it but are lyrics coming to you in those moments as well they are yeah a lot of times it'll spin off of a lyric that I, I'm listening into a song and I'll be like, oh, that's a cool turn of phrase, but then I'll think about how I relate to it. Um, or, and this very happens very often too, not in the same context that we're talking about, but I'll have a real life experience, a conversation with somebody um, or an event that I feel like sort of um, getting 
out some sort of form of catharsis a, a lot of times it might be an argument with someone i'm close to or somebody in my band or something like that and i'm straight into the notebook like rah, 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 rah. or <laughs> like furious scribbling yeah right? or you know it could be uh an inspir you know something i'm inspired by you know I, I did a my last release was an ep called ether that was kind of acoustic based and a lot of the lyric writing i did for that was based on like just sort of like kind of emerging into a new phase in my life and a lot of hope and a lot of transition and a lot of uh a lot of peace, you know, a lot of calm that hadn't been there in a long time. So really, you know, it's, it, it, I guess the, the, the summary of this is it really comes from all angles, but it, in reference to your specific question, these activities that are sort of monotonous and sort of lull us into a place of like a certain kind of hum, yeah. open that up where we can start listening to what's going on in our head and hopefully get some of that music that's in us, in our head out. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's funny because you just mentioned the word. My new album is called Hum, and it's exactly right. pretty much <laughs> the description of, of, of what you just said. Um, you know, this the, for me, like I got really, really bored as as fucked up and scared as it was uh, uh, as I was to be that ill uh, in bed for, you know, not being able to do much. Uh, it, it made a lot of energy happen when I finally got up and, 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 and recorded my record. But what would happen is is very often um, I I like 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 you. It's very hard for me to be bored, bored, bored. Um, it's better to describe it as as a as a maybe like a monotony or or like a meditative state. Like I love when I walk. I love putting on music that has a certain timeless feel, like Steve Reich or something that is less. It, it's it, it's long form and it it maybe doesn't. It, it's instrumental, so that so that it's just kind of this feeling of like you know, being able to walk for hours. I, I love, uh, it's one thing I miss about being in lockdown is just being able to walk um, because I, I, I find myself more able to, to be connected and, and, and meditate um, and let my mind kind of flow through, through stuff. Having, you know, having a lot of time, just, 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 uh, just locked down and, and sitting down. Sometimes it, it, it gets a little bit negative for me. You start to overthink allow myself to to overthink in, in, in those times. Um, so I try to neutralize that with uh, with listening to music. Um, and then, you know, in, in sometimes in, in the silences, when, when in, especially like in, if I'm in nature or, or walking around uh, the beach or somewhere, um, you start to kind of hear these these uh, these melodies based on the sounds that you're hearing. Like you said, you when you when you're gardening you, you uh when you you know you, you're mowing the lawn it's just like right and inside that goes <laughs> and you're like oh shit that's really cool um <laughs> and so, right? and yeah you outside, and you're like someone just <laughs> yeah where'd that come from <laughs> where'd that come from and that's a cool tone too i gotta remember that i'm mad you guys have talked a lot about emotion today are emotional extremes a hard place to write from? Um, is, it, 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 is it at some point where there's extreme sadness, extreme emotion? Uh, you know, are emotional extremes a difficult, is at some point an emotion becomes too extreme that it's just too difficult a place to write from? Hmm, I, don't, I don't know if it's, uh, I mean, I, my experience is, is, is no, is, is that the, the, if, when it gets to the extreme points, it's sometimes when 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 it get, makes you, you know, submit to to all of it and accept all of it and and feel the pain fully, and then from that place you can communicate things or open yourself up to you know less posing you know more more truthful raw to be okay with being really uh, really honest about something even if it m makes you seem weak or, or makes you seem um, uh, vulnerable you know. Yeah, Dep depending on your levels of uh, patriarchal upbringing, <laughs> so, but in general, I think it's healthy for anybody to accept, uh, 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 you know, to, to to be able to to be. I mean, for you know, for me, obviously, there's been, uh, you know, writing out of uh, a lot of anger uh, sometimes when I was a kid, and then later on, you know, writing out of extreme love, um, where it's that madness, um, the beautiful madness of falling so deep in love it's like you can't even you know it's 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 over um and then losing someone 
you know, it's just that it opens you up. And it, 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 it's actually, is for me, it's been kind of like a, like a catalyst for <clears throat> allowing myself to, to communicate so much of, of my life inside a song, as opposed to, you know, being more abstract in third person or storyteller kind of thing. I, I find of late that it's, it's very much me speaking um, or, or me imagining someone close to me uh, uh, communicating something. So I, I, find, I find it actually um, almost necessary for- Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, how about you, Mark? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, in terms of the, you know, the question was posed is, is it difficult to writing from that place and the actual writing I do, I agree with, with Alan, it's like necessary. It's, or, or at least, um, you know, it, it, it helps you navigate. It's cathartic, you know, it, yeah, it yeah. helps you process that. Um, you know, I, I have experienced some trauma in my life, you know, and I've written about losing a daughter. I've written about, um, you know, the lyrically about, um, forgiving my father for, you know, some of the conflict we had, um, you know, in my childhood and, and writing about, you know, us kind of reconciling and coming back to a good place. And so really, really personal stuff, um, you know, relationship stuff and all that stuff, you know, the heavy kind of things we go through. And I think for me, like, it's, it's, you know, like I was saying, it's necessary. It, it's, it's how it's, it's, it's how we, get through that stuff it's how we process it's the language we speak so it's how we sort of process that you yeah, know exactly. it's it's we'll it's, it. it's it's what we're most in touch with right so we go there to really get that out um i think for me the flip side of that is there have been times when i will sort of after the fact maybe dial it back a little bit in the lyrical sense because two reasons sometimes out of fear Sometimes I want to make it a little more abstract. So I'm not specifically talking directly about one pinpoint situation or person or conversation or whatever, because I just would like, I, I don't want to be that vulnerable or that revealing, or sometimes it's motivated by let's just dial this back in a broader sense. So that is there a way I can put this that still sings good, sounds good, feels good in the track and says what I want it to say, but leaves it a little more open-ended for a listener to mm -hmm. sort of relate to it because I think the most powerful songs and when we are at our best as artists is when we, we, when we are telling our story in such a way that it's honest and genuine, but it can be reinterpreted and connected with on a different level from someone else. And they make that their own. When the song becomes their song, yeah. not just our song or not even not in our song anymore. That mm -hmm. to me is when it's a home run because that's, now they're in someone else's internalizing that in their own way i don't like to give interviews and say you know what was this song about right. just, listen, just listen to it i'm yeah, not going to yeah. ruin it for you by telling you what i meant when i said that because yeah, that exactly. now that negates or wipes off any other possibility <laughs> from anyone that's going to listen to or read that interview that might take it a completely different way that's a hundred percent as valid in their life so to answer your question like no the, the actual the catalyst of your experience, your trauma, your extreme emotions, as you put it, good and bad, um, yeah. are really a great source of creativity and a great well of ideas. And it's, again, it's like, I think that's why we do what we do is because yeah, we, don't know, yeah. we don't know what to do with that shit, except yeah. to write about it and sing about it and play songs about it. Um, so it's, it's just more about then sort of maybe kind of to take a step back and looking at that and seeing now, now that was my personal part. Now, is it where it's sitting, right? Is it what I want to hang on the wall? You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so do you know, you know, I think Al, you've already mentioned walking, but do you, yeah. you know, Mark, I think it, both of you guys, is it, do you find that motion can play an effective role in that creative process? whether it's on a bus on a, on a staring out the window because i hear this a lot too whether it's walking biking driving anything like that i think it's lyrically i mean yeah i think lyrically it can for me yeah yeah musically almost i, I I'm, I'm just kind of kind of thinking about the essence of your question i almost think musically lyrically it does and i think musically being still does you know i think just not only just physically but yeah. sort of mentally still um you know, to actually kind of, I guess, channel that 
what whatever's going to come out uh, you know yeah. Yeah. through me into the guitar or out of the guitar and you know it's like uh so i think you know that, that might be too kind of yin and yang thing for for me at least i don't know i've never really thought of it but that way but yeah motion for sure in terms of like um again that sort of like lulling me into this yeah. place where i can sort of like zone yeah. out and then start kind of catching ideas and, and sort of netting them you know yeah uh i find motion as in travel too i i i end up um getting a lot of inspiration from traveling like uh looking out the window in an airplane looking out the window in a, in a train or a bus moving from you know uh, around the world walking all that other stuff i it, it kind of puts me in a very kind of uh, peaceful state and uh, it allows me to kind of feel an, a, a connection and an empathy to to the rest of uh, manifestation, as it were, or, or the universe. To you know, when we travel, we get to see um, immediately find it. You know, start with finding the commonality, the the, the connection to. Uh, you know, it could be a different language and, and different uh, 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 what's it called uh, traditions that they you know things that. But but we immediately look for those connections, and and you start to feel like a sense of family with 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 other human beings and I mean, since i was a teenager when we first started uh, traveling uh, and touring i love that part of it and, it and it helped me um really grow as a person and then also like traveling uh, even by not not moving which is like for me cinema like you know growing up on on uh uh nouvelle vague you know new wave french new wave cinema um fellini kurosawa a lot of that stuff, like I couldn't be in those places, and, and I got a, I got such a sense of what what how magical the world could be. Um, you know, the idea of ritual. I, I always like to read Paris Review, the Paris Review uh, uh, inter interviews with authors, and they talk about the things they need to have with them, times of day, rooms, things like that. And I will tell you, I know I've interviewed both of you, but it was a few years ago. Um, I started asking songwriters about. I, I, I am amazed how possessive songwriters are of the types of pens that they use, even ink mm. color and type of pen and even type of paper. I could do an entire website on that alone. Um, mm. So I guess the idea of ritual, how important is that? And I want, if you do have a favorite, please tell me, cause I'm fascinated by that, you know, brand, color, anything like that. But how important is ritual to the creative process to both of you? I will start with you. Like just routine, I guess, you know, routine, things you have to have yeah. with you. Um, uh, you know, like I, I for example, like uh, uh, my process, daily process uh, for quite a few years now. So seven years since I joined Instagram. At first there was no video, so I had to, but to have a scratch pad, a daily scratch pad that eventually end, ended up having a lot of, you know, uh, people that are resonating with, with my music and, and, and creative life be, be a part of, you know, and so... I pretty much start to lose my mind if I don't post for a couple of days. Um, not because I feel I need to, but it just, there's something about the process of like taking, like pressing record, allowing something to happen and then sending it out there and, and be fine whether it, whatever it's, 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 it's good. It's not good. It's, it's, it just is. And it is that thing that I felt today. I used to write a lot more poetry and, and put it up on, uh, on there. For some reason I've been a yeah, little. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I've been a little bit uh, uh, vacuous on the old, uh, um, not that, you know, I'm, I don't have writer's block regarding poetry. I just haven't been communicating through poetry for a couple of years now, which is really, really strange. I think I maybe has, I, I find myself, uh, uh, maybe that's more connected to, to being uh, in love with someone. You know? I, I think that uh, uh, I don't have any particular pens, but there's something really strange about uh if I write it out, I start, uh, you know, on, on whatever I have. I do like the little, the little fine point black, you know, with whatever paper I have. But there's something about putting it in a word processing program, you know, whatever, whatever it is, iPages, and then changing the font and seeing how the font looks. Some font, it, it makes it so official. Like, look at that font. That looks yeah. like it's in a page of a book or this poem. Or like being able to play around with how uh, a poem uh, is positioned, you know, the, 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 yeah. the, the, the visual motion feel of it. I mean, obviously E. Cummings is such a huge master of that. And yeah. a, lot, a lot of the formatting of poems becomes really important. Like you can copy and paste it and put it on, on something and then it loses the formatting and you're like, where did it go? It's like, 
you know, it's got, you know, yeah, that's for me anyway. Yeah. Mark. Yeah, I, it's, I've never really thought about this until you asked the question. It's funny, like, I, I don't have, a, like, a, a particular pen, uh, but scraps of envelopes tend to be, like, a real big thing for me. Like, the bills awesome. that you paid last week and, like, the envelope is still laying around. I'll have, like, just, like, just, like, two lines of a verse. You know what I mean? Just, like, a couple lines that I like the way the words sound together and, and, and the, the rhymes setting up and I'm just like, I'll scribble and they'll leave those all over the place. And it's like, put them in a stack. Please don't throw these away, you know? Um, and then <laughs> you know, more recently I have gotten, and it's, it's, it's sort of, um, I don't love it, but it's practical and I'm getting used to it of taking those ideas or when I get an idea, putting it in the notes section on my phone and, um, simply because I know it'll be there. Cause sometimes you're just like, what was that line I had? It was great. You know? And mm -hmm. then, uh, now it's there. And then you go back and see it and you're like, ah, that's not that great, but I got a new idea. You know what I mean? Right. And that stuff's there. Um, uh, I don't have a favorite pen. A lot of Sharpies laying around here. We just, um, <laughs> we recently like finished and lamb finished a new album and I had to, I, I had to sign 5,000 CD booklets. Um, so there were a bunch of sharpies around, and there just generally are anyway. That's a lot. So, That's a lot so, of yeah, I know it was it was quite a project. Um, so yeah, usually it's sharpie on an on a torn envelope until it makes it into my phone just for for a backup. Yeah. Last question. You guys are both men of letters, learned men of letters, <laughs> and I know I've talked to both of you about what you like to read. So Mark, we'll start with you. you I've know. been I've been dreading this question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> know that I'm barely literate. Um, man, I haven't been reading, honestly. Really? I really haven't been reading. Um, I don't know what the, you know, I've, I've read, uh, I guess, just like biographies, you know. Yeah. I'm, I'm still reading Lanigan's book. I haven't finished that. And the one I read before that was Steve Gorman's book. So I'm reading my friend's autobiographies, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Are you, are you, do you appear in the autobiography? I mean, I, 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 I haven't read Lanigan's. I, I helped um, clean up some of the audio and I heard some of it. It's pretty intense Lanigan's. I bet, I bet it would be tough for you to read. You know, the, our singer in Lamb of God, Randy Bly, wrote an autobiography and I can't read it. And he knows this. Um, I, told, I was just like, man, I tried reading some of your book and I just feel like I'm trapped in the back lounge of the bus with you and I can't escape. <laughs> like you're, you know what I mean? Like you're just talking and talking and talking and I can't get out. You know, I, know. I, I love like, Randy like a brother, man. He's one of my best friends in the whole world and, and we're brothers, but it's like, yeah, that's one that I don't, I don't know that I'll make it all the way through. So it might be hard for you to read Mark's book. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to try. And obviously it's, 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 it's creating a lot of, uh, I mean, it's got a New York times bestseller. I mean, Sunday times bestseller and stuff it's it's pretty intense i mean you know he, he had a crazy you know it's been a survivor and he lived through some heavy shit um i recently i haven't been reading that much except for my usual stephen king uh on the on the flights you know i love i love uh, you read the new book have you read the new uh, book yeah, I just got it. I, I, I'm going to start that. It's the, the, the short stories. The yeah, it's supposed stories. to be good. I have it. I haven't started. Yeah. So. I mean, he's, 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 he, he, he can be so incredible. I mean, yeah. I, I, some, some of my favorite books. Yes, he's popular. Yes, it's, you know, horror. But, but, but his, his take on and his analysis and, and meditation on human beings and their behavior and, and good and evil and, and, the, and the kind of pendulum in between. Really fascinating. Yeah. But lately... Um, I've been kind of fascinated with Arthur C. Clarke's short stories. Oh, really? There's one called The Possessed. It's very short. And there's quite a few that, uh, you know, uh, what is it called? Uh, uh, Four Billion Names uh, uh, for God. Um, he has such an amazing way of, of combining, like, si the science fiction aspect with, with kind of, like, a esoteric, you know, um, exploring, you know. They're always kind of a little bit sad. There's always a little bit of a, of a sadness um, to them. It's pretty, you guys can see.